If you would, please turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1. Found on page 1288 of your Pew Bibles. James chapter 1. I will be reading verses 16 through 18. Here, for this is God's word. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, your mercy toward us is unending. As we look into your word, we thank you that you have provided it. And Lord, we thank you that you have granted us the mercy to look into it and that you have granted us the good gift of your spirit to illumine our minds to it. So we pray that you would help us and guide us through this passage this morning and we consider what we are called to be in light of your glorious truth and your glorious grace in Christ Jesus. We thank you and we praise you this morning through Christ's name. Amen. Considering this passage this morning, I've looked and saw it broken up into two sections here that is still all connected to the unchangeable goodness of God and how his goodness cannot be moved toward those who, whom he loves. And we see a description of the unchangeable God in verses 16 to 17. And then in verse 18, we see the first fruits of this unchangeable God. James begins in Verse 16 with, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. First question we ask is, what was their deception? Well, their deception, as we looked into last time, was believing that God was culpable or he was to blame for all their hardships, for all their trials and temptations. But James concluded that God is not to blame and Verse 13, for he is good and all that comes from him is good. He is not evil in his nature and he does not tempt anyone with evil. Man is to blame for all the wrongs in the world. Evil entered the day that man disobeyed and it has been total destruction and decay ever since. So he says, do not be deceived, because God cannot tempt anyone to sin. And here he is contrasting sinful man and God. Everything evil, including sin and its results, which is death, comes from man, while Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Every good and every perfect gift means not only good as, as in moral, but every complete or every whole gift. For the Christian, it is the good and perfect gift that brings us to completion, to wholeness, to maturity in the Christian life. We think of the Holy Spirit as the ultimate good and perfect gift given to us from God our Father. And maybe even the trials and the suffering that we go through as 
good gifts to bring us to wholeness or completion. It, it, it may not be good in the moment as far as our own estimation, but it is good in God's estimation that we go through various trials. God is good, so his gifts are good and perfect. Not only that, but what he is saying here is that every good gift, meaning everything truly good, period, comes from a good God. The origin of everything good in this world comes from the hand of God. He is not the author of evil. He's not the author of sin. And he cannot be accused of sin. He is the immediate provider of all good things. And it says here, it comes down from the Father of lights. God said in the beginning, let there be light. And there was light. And here we know he's speaking of all that God created in the celestial. We think of the sun, moon, and stars that govern the sky. This is pointing to God's sovereign governance and his good providential care for his creation. He put all things in its proper place for all that he created, to care for it. He put the sun where it is and the moon and the stars in their place all to sustain those living on earth, right? To sustain puny creatures like ourselves, those of the dust. When you think of the sun, it is 109 times the diameter of the earth. And yet, it was put there for his creatures here on this tiny planet in its proper place. So God alone knows how to best care for the world, let alone his own children. And notice where he goes with this. He describes God as the creator of the heavenly lights or the father of lights to say that he is not like his creation. He is the creator of the celestial beings and these heavenly lights are constantly moving and they're constantly changing for the sake of man to sustain man. As man is constantly moving and changing on the earth, these heavenly lights are constantly casting shadows on man. As when the sun is at a certain position in the sky, it casts a shadow where we look behind and sometimes we try to follow that shadow as it's constantly moving. But this was all to contrast God with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In other words, his creation, his creatures change, but he does not. Every good and perfect gift is from a God who is unchanging and unchangingly good in his nature. While man's nature changes from depravity to grace, which ends in glory, or from dep depravity to eternal death, and we see this in verses 12 to 15, there is always a progression or digression in man in his state. But in God, there is no progression. There is no change in his state. He is infinitely and eternally good and unchangeable. His integrity to his children, his loyalty to his children, his faithfulness toward his children are unchangeable. This is the foundation or the grounds to which we have hope, especially in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a God who is not moved by man. This is the grounds which James builds upon for his entire letter. We have an almighty God who keeps his promises and who is worthy 
of our trust. That is the gospel of hope. It is an unchangeable gospel. It doesn't change no matter what man does. And it is grounded in an unchangeable God, an unchangeably good God. An error that we tend to make in modern evangelicalism is that in many different ways we teach that God changes in order to relate to us or that God suffers with us. But traditionally we have always affirmed what the scripture teaches, that God does not suffer or change in himself. If he did, we would have no hope. And we we affirm that he does. He does relate to us. He does relate to us as he is our creator, creator, so he automatically relates to us. But he doesn't have to become like the creature in order to relate to us. He created us. And being our creator, he automatically relates to us. Now we make the distinction, yes, Christ suffered in his human nature. And he suffered for the sake of our sins. And he suffered so we would sympathize with our weakness. But God, in his divine nature, he does not change. Just like James said that God cannot be tempted, here he says God cannot change. God is unchangeable. So his goodness is unchangeable. Again, if he did, we would have no hope. We would have no foundation to rely upon. So what does that mean for us? Well, if he does not change in his goodness toward his children, he does not change in providing these good gifts that he gives And this is what James is getting at. Remember back in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, he he is the God who gives generously to all without reproach, undividedly. He is unchangeable. He is unchangeably loyal to his children. He is singular in his intent. And it is from God's unchangeable nature and character that he gives these good gifts to his children. And when we think about it, he doesn't wait until we suffer or when we are being tempted or tested before he gives us these good gifts. He doesn't say, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen to you. Here's a good gift. Here you go. Rather, he willed it before the foundation of the world that he gives good gifts to his children in order to bring them to himself and to form them in the image of his beloved son to make them whole and perfect. And that would bring us to the next point. Verse 18 the first fruits of the unchangeable God. Verse 18 begins with, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Now we must continue the same line of thought here as we continue in this text that not only is God immovable and unchangeable, but his will and decree is unchangeable. Numbers 23, 19 says this, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. He has said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Again, this is all speaking of his will. Some of you who were here last Sunday evening Remember that I was teaching on how God is without passions. He is immovable. When we consider Psalm 2, verse 4, and 
how the nations were plotting and scheming against the Lord and his Messiah or his church. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. Now, does this mean he is literally laughing, sitting up there in the sky, away from us, aloof? No, that is not what the text is implying. It is saying, despite man's efforts, despite the plotting, the scheming, democratic voting, whatever it may be, his will will not change. His will cannot be altered. His will will come to pass. And no one, no matter the plotting or the scheming, they're not able to change it. Why? Because it is based on his nature and character. James says that God gives good gifts and that he is not like us. Despite man, he is without any variation or shadows due to change. And it is from that foundation that he continues and says, of his own will of this unchanging, immovable God's will, he brought us forth. And he answers that in the text, what is his will? Ephesians 1, 3 to 6 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Here he describes not only the good gifts that he gives to his church, the the spiritual blessings, but he also describes his will of his own will. This is the decree in eternity past between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it cannot be changed. It cannot be altered. It cannot be moved. Now in considering... Verse 17, where James says that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, then he describes what the Father brings forth, or in other words, what he births. He brings forth good. James is still using birthing language, just as he did in verse 15 here when he speaks of our desire and how it gives birth to sin and then sin brings forth death. And this is contrasted with God who doesn't tempt anyone to sin, but instead he gives good and perfect gifts and it is of his own good will he brought us forth. His church, his new creation. This is the contrast Us, man, what do we bring forth? Our desires, birth, sin, and sin brings forth death. But God reverses that. God brings forth life. He brings forth a new creation. He brings forth new creatures. And next we see how he accomplishes this. Notice how. It says here, by the word of truth. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, in other words. It is the word of truth that God uses as an instrument to bring people back to life, to have true life. He calls us. Or, in other words, he summons us by his word and gives us life. This is what Jesus meant when he said, 
My sheep hear my voice. When we hear the good news, there is always a response, isn't there? Whether it is belief or unbelief, there is always a response to the word of truth. And the end of belief is that, as he describes here, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Again, he is continuing his birthing language here. These are creatures born from above, born of the Spirit, as Jesus says in John 3, 1 to 8. And as Paul says in Romans 8, 23, speaking of all creation groaning, he says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, we were brought forth by God our Father, reborn by His Spirit to be new creatures in a new creation, to be His first fruits. Here again, it is speaking of birthing language, but it also has this notion of bringing a harvest at the end time. And, and there will be reaping. And leading up to that point, there will be pruning and there will be ripening of the soul as it turns to God. <coughs> and when the time of reaping comes, sin and all its destruction, sin and death, and all of the disastrous consequences will be left behind. Sin brings forth death, but God brings forth the first fruits of his creation in new life. This idea of first fruits has been open to us throughout scriptures. We see in the beginning the first proclamation of the gospel in Genesis 3.15. It was speaking of Christ as the seed of the woman. And it comes to fruition in Jesus Christ when he comes. Christ is considered the first fruits of the first fruits. As we read in 1 Corinthians 15.20-23. 20 says this. But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. As he says here, the first fruits of his creatures. By God's spirit, his ultimate and perfect gift is that we are made first fruits of his creatures. By Christ, as it says in John 1.12, that he gave the right for those who believe to become children of God. This is what it means to be first fruits of his creatures. And it begins with Christ and having Christ as yours. Christ came into this world not only to recreate or to begin this new creation by his own doing, doing his father's will, but he himself was the first fruits of God and his creation according to his human nature. Another way of putting it, he is the forerunner of our faith. Well, the firstborn of the dead, firstborn of all creation, the new creation that is. He went ahead of us to prepare a place for us. And it is in him that all things hold together. 
as he is the body, uh, as he is the head of the body of his church, as his church is united to him. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. It is his voice that we are to hear, speaking in his word. And it is by that voice, by that word, his word of truth, that we are brought forth. So if in Christ he is the first fruits of God's creation, then it is natural that we are called to be first fruits of his creatures as we are being conformed into his image, the image of God's Son, our Creator, who is the firstborn among many brothers, as it says in Romans 8.29 and Colossians 3.10. The same word used here for first fruits has also been used to speak of the early converts of the church or those converted in the first generation of the church. We see this in Romans 16 and 1 Corinthians 16. But we ask ourselves, to what end? What is the end of this bringing forth that God has done in making us new? Well, Paul speaks tenderly to the Thessalonians when he says this. But we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers and the beloved, beloved in the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. This is he who called you through our gospel, or in other words, as James puts it, who called you through, through the word of truth with an end in view so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says this, so then brothers, stand firm. This is demonstrating the immovable and unchangeable character and nature of God and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by spoken word or by letter. You see the pattern, it's the same pattern here. God brought us forth by the word of truth in order to be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So how are we to apply this today to ourselves? Romans eleven sixteen is a good place to look. It says this, if the if the dough offered as first fruits is holy, speaking of Christ, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, speaking of Christ, so are the branches. Israel in the Old Testament was called holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. Just as those whom Jesus redeems from the earth and he calls them virgins, the first fruits for God and the Lamb. You see the goodness and the faithfulness of God is most uniquely demonstrated in the salvation of sinners. The fact that he gives new birth to undeserving lawbreakers is a wonder indeed, isn't it? This is the ultimate good and perfect gift. As we said earlier, the gift of the Holy Spirit. His example of good and persistent giving is found when he converts one who has no interest in God, who is totally and utterly rebellious against God, when he turns this one person to become a child of God by the working of his Holy Spirit. We see his goodness. We see his faithfulness. The fact that he wasn't obligated to. The fact that he should have destroyed all of creation the moment that man sinned. The fact that he should have tossed 
Adam and Eve in hell. At the outset, it demonstrates his goodness. It demonstrates his faithfulness. And we continue to offend him. And he still forbears with us. The fact that he doesn't destroy us. And that he saves anyone. And makes him a first fruits, a kind of first fruits of his creatures is beyond our own comprehension. It is all of grace. But, but this is the character, right? This is the character that James is calling us to. To demonstrate that we are the first fruits of his creatures. So the line of argument may go like this. It begins with every good and perfect gift, complete and whole, coming from God. And when it's brought to its end in our lives, we are to demonstrate it in integrity and virtue that only comes from God, the Holy Spirit. We are to be his first fruits in goodness and holiness and righteousness. And it is oftentimes displayed in our giving to others, right? Whether it is giving of time or money or resources. It is in our love for one another that we display that unchanging goodness of God to his children. Even to those who hurt us. God gave to us before we did anything remotely good. Actually, he gave to us even after we sinned against, against him. And he continually gives to us now, even as we sin against him now. This is the character that James wants his readers to form as children of God. In a wicked world that runs in the opposite direction of cold-heartedness and malice toward others. We are to give even and especially when there is no return. Why? Why? Because it reflects the goodness and grace of God as we love one another. And, and soon this will be an unending love, a love that will never end as it is found in God and in his new creation, in the new heavens and the new earth. And it is all part of his redemptive plan that we are to love God and love one another for all eternity. So this giving that God gives is to be exemplified in the Christian, forming good stewards as God is a good steward, right? In his giving. Many of us may be totally and utterly discouraged by this at this moment. We don't see this in our own lives. We see nothing but chaos, sin, disorder, contradictions in our lives or hypocrisy. All these things that speak of death and destruction. But remember, we see that. We are to be first fruits. And just like any harvest, it begin, begins with a seed that is planted. And it goes through much forming and growing and pruning, ripening. And then one day, it will blossom. Many ends will be cut off, but it will blossom inevitably. So long as there is water and proper light given. And we can apply this to even the word. As we hear the word as it flows into us and we receive it. And Christ works by his spirit in our hearts. 
it will grow good first fruits. And James knows this. James knows when he wrote this letter that there is cold heartedness, that there is malice, and that, that there is this temptation to leave the faith. And that is why he's writing this. But there must be in the Christian life this constant moving and growing. And the question is, do you see this in your own life? Is there a change? And I'm speaking beginning with the inward change. Is there a change in your appetite, your desires? Is there a response to this word? In other words, do you love him? Do you love the church? Then you must be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It's inevitable. Also, from this text, we can say we are called to become persistent, steadfast, and immovable Christians, always abounding in the work of the Lord, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Why? Because we are to be like him. We are to be like him in immovable goodness and holiness. It demonstrates and points to our God and his unchangeable and immovable good nature toward his creatures. We will fall at many times, much more than we can count. But it is in the persistent getting back up and going to Christ for not only our justification, but our sanctification, our progression in holiness. And remember, he will accept you because you are his child. And he knows you. He knows how frail and feeble you are. But we are still called. We're still called to be immovable and unchangeable Throughout our course of life, the direction of holiness, as we are being fed each week, we, we come to hear the word of the Lord spoken and declared to you, and allow this to sink in deep into the soil and feed the root, and let it grow by God's spirit. We are to be immovable in our faith. Remember, he is addressing folks who are not only thinking of abandoning their resistance towards sin, but he's addressing folks who are thinking of abandoning the faith altogether. They're thinking of abandoning the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we call throughout the scripture the unforgivable sin, to, to leave Christ altogether. But he has been telling them to be steadfast in their faith. Hold on to Christ. And he points to a God who does not change. As the grounds of it all. He is the grounds of our confidence. He is the grounds of our assurance. He is the grounds of our strength and courage. He is the grounds of all of our goodness, of anything good that comes out of us. So he is the grounds of an immovable faith. Because he is immovable. So I'll ask you one question. Is this your God? Let us pray. Father, thank you that we can run to you as your children. In the many areas we may fall short, Lord, for you are immovable in your grace and your mercy that you have shown your children. And you are forming us, Lord, by word and spirit into new creatures. And we thank you with immense joy as you fill our hearts with your spirit. And we ask that by your mercy you continue 
to minister to us by your spirit. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.